Our memory verse today is found in uh, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 25. If you'll notice on your sheet, most of the scripture is from Proverbs. And I'm going to tell you why it's, most of it's from Proverbs. It's because Proverbs is probably one of the greatest uh, books in the Bible for wisdom about life. And you know, there's nothing more kind of core to life than relationships. And so if you're a person who's alive today and you're here, and I assume that's everybody here, <laughs> that's kind of, we hope it is, anybody. If, if you sense anybody's dying around, you know, shake them or do something, give them CPR. Um, but, but so everybody that's here, you have relationships. So when we talk about this idea of relationships, these concepts of relationships, what we know is we're, everybody, you know, sometimes you can talk about topics or ideas or thoughts that maybe somebody's not dealing with right now in their life. But everyone here right now, you have relationships. And probably most of you, most of us have some good relationships and have some okay relationships. And you might even have some that have some awful relationships. And so, uh, so but relationships are a part of life and uh, a part of this stuff of life. And, this, and so Proverbs talks a lot about relationships and about the concept uh, particularly that we're talking about today. And so uh, you're going to be hearing a lot from the, from the uh, book of Proverbs. And so our memory verse is this, a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. The first part of that verse is awesome. Second part is the one I'd like to kind of focus on uh, for your memory's sake. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Don't raise your hand because I already know the answer. And the answer is you would raise your hand if you were honest on this. So don't raise your hand because this is for everybody. Have you ever had a pity party before? Okay, don't raise your hand because I know you did. Okay, all right. You say, well, I just had a short one. It's okay, you've had one. Some people have like have real long ones. Other people do, you know, special. If, if you're a really positive person, you generally only have real short ones. But everybody's had a pity party. You felt sorry for yourself about something. You felt like that somehow you didn't, you were overlooked or you didn't get in, whatever it was that caused your pity party. But everybody's had a pity party. And so sometimes when we have a pity party, what we are wondering is, why didn't somebody notice and come along and cheer me up? And the Bible just has a way of turning this stuff on us and saying, well, if you want cheered up, I'll tell you a good way to cheer up. Go cheer somebody else up. We want to sit around and let everybody come to us. And the scripture says, hey, if you want to be refreshed, if you want to feel better, if you want to feel cheered up, go do something for someone else. Go refresh someone else. Go cheer somebody else up. And so uh, it, it's not really complicated. It's actually pretty simple. But I believe that there's a lot of truth to that. So if you're feeling down today, uh, I, I want you to be, you have to be gentle, but figure out some way to think of somebody that needs encouragement and go encourage them sometime this week. And you'll be surprised that you don't find yourself finding encouragement. And so, uh, I, I mean, I've got stories I could tell, but I, I'm afraid I'll get hung up here and I'm gonna get moving into our, into our uh, message. Now, I wanna move on down to the first thought that you see on your notes in front of you. If you don't have your notes, maybe grab them beside you. And, uh, and the, 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 I wanna talk about the critical nature of growth for a few minutes at the outset here. And uh, because, because I think what happens to us is we get a little bit too hung up on events and we begin to ro kind of romanticize relationships centered around certain events and certain things that, uh, that, are, that are like a given circumstance. Uh, and, and what happens with that is we neglect the very nature of growth because, because one-time events are just that. They're one-time events. They could be very, very important, but they're just one-time events. And we have a tendency to get stuck in the mode of those one-time events and kind of center everything else relationally around those. And I'll just mention a few of those to you. Uh, we romanticize relationships by putting too much emphasis on certain events, such as, and not enough emphasis on growth. And, and so, like this. Let's just say that if you have a middle school student, if you do, they're probably over there, so we can talk about them right now, okay? Um, and a middle school, if I've heard middle school students before say to me, I'm going out with so-and-so. I'm like, pardon me? 
you're going out with so-and-so? Where are you going? And who's driving, for Pete's sake? Who's, who's, you know, here, you know what I've noticed? If somebody in middle school gets hung up on a relationship, guess what happens? They shut down on all the other relationships around them. They get zeroed on this, and somewhere down the road, probably in a few weeks, a few months, sometimes I've seen it happen in a few years, which is really sad, that thing goes away, and they lost all that time with all those other friends, and all the, they didn't live as a middle school student. They tried to live like an adult, like they were in this you know, relationship. What a sad thing. And so when you're in middle school, don't focus on, you know, I know I'm talking to the choir here on this one, okay, so I'm just move on from there. But, you know, dating in middle school is a joke. And I don't mean, I mean, now don't tell your kid that, okay? I'm saying that because they're not in here. But that's a joke. And it, it, because that needs to be something they don't focus on. It's, it, and so, uh, anyway, uh, isolates them, they can't even drive. A wedding. A wedding instead of building a life. Now, I, I'm not, I think weddings are very, very important, okay? Don't get me wrong. I think they're critically important, and I don't think they should ever be minimized. And for your wedding planner, then you really don't think so, do you? So anyway, but, um, but, but it, so, so weddings are great, and they're wonderful, but they are a one-day event. And sometimes, now this is just the practical side of ride, okay? And I'm not suggesting that this really would be the case, because I think a wedding should be a big deal. But sometimes I've thought, if you went to your parents, who are maybe going to help you, and let's say, I've heard numbers. I know what my adult daughter cost me. Uh, I mean, you know, I, that, that doesn't sound right. I know how much it costs to get the matrimony thing taken care of there, you know, and, and have that great day. And it was a great day, and it was wonderful. And I don't regret any of it, and we didn't overdo it, uh, but almost. It's like... Uh, some days I thought maybe we were. But here's the deal. If you were to take what a lot of weddings cost today and utilize that as a down payment so people can have a house to live in and move forward with their lives. Now, when I say that, that sounds like I'm a killjoy. I don't mean it. Have a great wedding. But don't spend your future on your wedding day. That's all I'm saying. It is a very, very important day. It's a, it is so important. It's important to invest time. It's important to stand in front of people and say in front of people, you know, for better, for worse, for richer, or poorer, because there's a lot of commitment. That, when it's made public, it just makes it a lot, I don't know, it seals it. It's a great thing, great thing. So I'm not against that. I'm just simply saying, if you live so much for your wedding, you're going to have to wake up, you know, two or three weeks down the road and forgot how to pay bills and do this and do that and live life. And uh, just make sure you're not sacrificing what life is about in a given moment. The birth of a child. Now, I, I think the birth of a child is one of the most amazing things. It's one of, the, it's one of my favorite things as a pastor and I go to the hospital and I see this brand new baby and I see these smiles smeared across you know, uh, people's faces. Um, the, the last baby I think it was was uh, was Megan, who is uh, Nathan's sister-in-law, and she and her husband come to church here on a fairly regular basis. But their little one, well, I, when I walked in the room, she was holding the baby, and he just had this like he looked like he'd eaten three bananas sideways. He's just you know, his face didn't even look normal. He was just smiling so big. It was like it was crazy. You know, it was like, and he was just I could just tell he was one of these. I mean, he is going to be an amazing dad. Because he is like, he's just gone over that baby. And, and you can just see it all over him. And that's, that is so, so amazing and so wonderful. And I love to be able to hold that baby and say a prayer with the parents at Thanksgiving. And then be able to hand the baby back to them. Uh, you got that part, right? Um, because I do know what's on the other side of that. And, uh, and so... But it is a great, great moment. But if you live only for the birth of that baby and forget that they poop and pee and they cry in the middle of the night and, and you're going to go sleep. You know, there's a reason why there's this thing called postpartum depression, you know, because there's sort of a letdown. Are you sad you have a baby? No. But it's like there's this glow, this all this, and then... Real life hits. Real life hits. 
and it's kind of tough. It's kind of hard. You know, I bumped into Shelly and Philip last night at a store, and, uh, and, and I, I was, as I was reviewing my message this morning, that it came back to me that I kind of found myself doing this very same thing because I was looking at their, um, I got to remember which, which prophet he is, which, <laughs> which, which prophet, it's your middle son, which, Elijah, Elijah okay. Uh, I'm going to, I just, those last two, I'm going to get them confused. Uh, so Elijah, he was, uh, he, he was sitting in the front. I didn't see him at first. I was talking to saw a little baby um, at Micah and Isaiah. I know their names. I'm just going to get them turned around here, okay? But, uh, but, but I, I was, you know, when Isaiah comes up, Philip comes up, we're just all, and I was like, all of a sudden I'm missing one. And he was sitting down front, but he was grinning like a chessy cat. He's at two years old. And he was just, then he just, you know, started being a two-year-old and everything. And I said, you know, I was asking how close he is in the relationship age of my granddaughter. Because my little granddaughter, who's two right now, has, she's made toast out of me. You know, she's just like, she's like this perfect child. She isn't, but she is to me. And, uh, and, and when she comes up to me and she raises her hand up to me and goes, pops, and grabs my hand and starts to dry. I go wherever she tells me. I go, you know, I've had tea parties, everything else. I mean, it's just like, whatever you tell me to do, I'm doing it. You know, she just drags me around. And, and she's got me wrapped. And I just, and I said to Shelly, I said, and, and Philip, I said, you know what? Uh, oh, this two to four is just like the perfect age. But you know, and it is, it is great. But you know what? You know what I'm ignoring by that? It's real easy to focus in on what we really like, the age, and forget that all ages are important and each have their own specialness. And that we have to learn to grow and enjoy, not get stuck in babyhood, not get stuck in toddlerville, but keep growing. I think one of the most aggravating things to me about my adult kids when they became middle school students and high school students and then young adults, Lord forbid, but anyway, um, was this. I, when, when, they would, when they would kind of move into a new arena, you know, I felt pretty grown up. I felt fairly mature. But all of a sudden, I felt like that made me uncomfortable. Them moving into that, that new arena made me uncomfortable. And I would have to be honest with myself and say, okay, Rod, this is, you're going to have to grow up more here. And you're going to have to accept this is where we are. And I didn't always want to grow up to that. I want to stay here. Let's stay. Let's keep them two, three, and four. Let's go back to two, three, and four. That's, yeah, it's frustrating, but boy, that's fun. And it's so safe. This felt unsafe. This felt like the unknown. This felt like the frontier. And sometimes I didn't want to go there. And so sometimes I went dragging and screaming into that. But the truth of the matter is, your life will force you to continue growing up. Now, you can resist it, and you can run from it, and you can, you can say, I'm not going to, and just throw up your hands. But life will continue, and I think as long as we live, there's going to be things that happen that force us to keep growing up. And relationships are the number one way God's going to keep growing us up. And there's sometimes I just want to stand out on the curb and say to God, is not disrespectfully, but as firmly as I could, just say, I'm grown up enough. Please? You know, because, because he's always taking us past our comfort zone. Always taking us past that. And that's, that's not fun and it's not easy, but it is necessary for us to grow up and for us to embrace where we are now, not where we used to be, not how it could have been, not what we liked it to be, not what felt so comfortable to us, but to embrace where we are now. And then, you know, another, another place is, you know, leaving for college. It's like another one of those like big points. And so sometimes, you know, at that point, we want to go curl up in a fetal position and go, what happened? You know, how did, how did we get here? They're gone now and they're, you know, and sometimes maybe you're glad. You're going like, thank God we're here. They're gone now, you know, whatever it is, whichever way it is, but it's still a growth point. And, and, and so we can live just in those, those high moments, but the truth is there's a lot of life lived in between. And so I'm going to talk today in the next few minutes or more 
but uh, about what growth requires from us. And, uh, and, and before we do that, let me just read this verse of scripture to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. What is 1 Corinthians chapter 13 called? The love chapter. You maybe didn't know this is in the love chapter, but it is in the love chapter, okay? And it's verse 11. It says this. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a I reasoned like a When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. Now, that's a that's a great great verse. But you know what? The Apostle Paul wrote that, and he wrote it from a standpoint of God's inspiration. So it's something for us to pay close attention to. And I think when we read that, I think maybe we have to go, hmm, is that true for me? I put the ways of childhood behind me. Am I growing up? Am I really facing adulthood? Am I embracing it? Am I embracing it in fullness? Or am I trying to run from that? Trying to hide from that? It's something to consider. Growth is critical for maturity to happen in our lives. Now let's talk about what growth requires in relationships. Number one, growth requires time. Growth requires time. I'm going to read these Proverbs to you and then I'm going to talk to you a few minutes about this. Since those who work their land will have abundant food. Maybe you ought to underline the phrase, work their land. And in particular, circle the word work. Work. Those who work their land will have abundant food. But those who chase fantasies have no sense. Next verse from Proverbs. Whoever is patient has great understanding. But one who is quick-tempered displays folly. Circle the word patient in that one. And then the last verse in this section is better a patient person than a warrior. That's kind of surprising. One with self-control than one who takes a city. I think that seems very surprising. Someone who would be a great warrior, somebody who could take a city. It's even better to be a patient person, better to be a person with self-control. Now, what is self-control called in the New Testament? It is a what? Pardon me? Fruit of the Spirit. And so I believe self-control is not something where we just by gritting it, but it's where we allow God to give us control of our spirit. He gives us, he, he controls our lives. We give him control of our life. That's how we gain self-control. So here's, here's what I say. Growth takes time. You know, you can plant a seed and you won't even see it for a while, but that seed will eventually pop up and then eventually, you know, over time, you'll have a flower, you'll have a harvest, you'll have something, you have tomatoes, you have whatever it is that you planted, you'll have that happen. But it takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. And we live in a world that lives in the instant. We have instant this, instant that, instant everything. And I just need to tell you, you have to give your relationships time. You have to, and, 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 and even uh, relationships that are going well, not only do you give it time, but you invest time. You invest time into it. You know, anything that um, is of value to us, we give time to it. Uh, we, 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 you know, if you have a hobby, um, you will find a way to spend some time with that hobby if it's something that you really enjoy, you're passionate about. Uh, back when I had a motorcycle, I would, I could be busy as all get out, but I would find ways to work riding the motorcycle into my schedule or into, you know, just find some time. I would, I would work hard to find time to be able to ride the motorcycle because I really, really liked that. I enjoyed it. And, and so we, we will make time for the things that we really want to do, that we're passionate about in life. And so if you are passionate about your relationship with your spouse, then you need to create time with that spouse. You need to give them time. And, uh, and, and, you know, quality time is one of the uh, five love languages, and I believe that it's one that is very pretty active. A lot of people have that as a love language. And so if you're always too busy to spend time, you know, you can be in the same house and not spend time together. You understand that? You can be in the same house and not spend time together. And, and sleeping in the same bed does not necessarily equate, it is time, but it's, you know, if you're, if you're snoring all night long, you know, and all that, you know, you can, there's, there's, anyway, 
uh, and so, so that, that sleeping time does not necessarily equate to time together either, a little bit, but not, not, not completely. And so I'm talking about time where there's conscious engagement, time where that person knows you are spending time with them. And so if you have relationships that matter to you, and right now in this, in this message, I'm really mostly talking about what we talked about last week is primary relationships, your primary relationships. Uh, the others are important and they matter, but your primary relationships, if you don't take time for your primary relationships, then in a sense, you won't do well in any relationships. Um, and so growth requires time. I guess you ask this, yourself this question. How much time do I commit to spending with my spouse? How much time do I commit to that? You say, well, they never asked me to do that. I didn't ask that question. I'm asking, how much time do you intentionally spend with your spouse? Do you have intentional time that you've scheduled? You know, if we, if we were to say we need to meet this week or something, we would schedule a time to meet. I'm not saying you have to schedule it formally, but you need to informally at least schedule. And sometimes if your life is busy enough, you actually need to schedule time. Say, we're going to spend half of this day together, or we're going to spend this evening together, or we're going to, and we're going to, you know, go over our finances, or we're going to talk about this, or we're going to, you know, go over what's going on with the kids. But you have to, you have to make time. And if you don't make time, time will just keep right on going by. Keep right on going by. Keep right on going by. Now with your children or with your parents, you know, whatever it is, do you spend time, intentional time? And again, not just living in the same house, but do you give them time? Uh, I noticed this. Uh, Vanjie had Emily, our little granddaughter, the other day. Now, she's reached this stage where everything she does, she decided it's a very important to have somebody watch her do it. So now her favorite words are, watch me. Watch me. I was actually trying to have a conversation with Vanjie. And uh, she kept going, Nana, watch me. Now, one of the things that she was doing was, in the chair that I was sitting on, she was getting up on the side of it, and she was going, pops, boom, and then she just jump, you know, like I'm supposed to catch her. And so she has this, you know, great faith that she can jump from wherever and she'll be caught. So she's, she's and, and, but she would do, she would go, she would turn before she did and go, Nana, watch me, watch me. So everything was, watch me, watch me. And I'm going, man. How do you get anything done when you have her? She goes, I don't. I, mean, she says, I don't get anything done when I have her. It's just, you know, it's watch me. It's in full engagement. Now, you can't do that with your kids all the time. But if you have a grandkid for a few hours out of the week, you can do that, okay? And so, uh, and so, and so but, but the question is, what kind of quality time are you given to the people that are your primary relationships? And, and that means doing something that is engaging with them, whether it's games, whether it's puzzles, whether it's, you know, uh, uh, watching a movie together, whatever it might be, what are you doing to engage them with you and, and uh, engage yourself with them? Number two, growth requires light. And uh, truth is, is in brackets there beside because by, by light, uh, what we know is we know that uh, a plant to grow requires some level of light. And for relationships to grow, it requires truth. It requires, it requires trust. Truth, trust comes from truth, where, where you, you're, you're truthful with each other. Now, the verse of scripture that I have on your sheet is a very great verse of scripture. It's very important, but I gave Kim the wrong verse. And so, uh, so I'm going to read to you the verses that I intended. It's still from 1 John, and it's still from 1 John chapter 1. And uh, verse 7 was the one that I intended to put down, and I put down verse 9. And so you have 9 in front of you, a great verse, but just save that for later. Um, but right now I'm going to read, I'm going to expand that out a little bit since I'm opening up the scripture here to read it to you. I'm going to read from verse five through verse seven. It says, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light in him. There is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. Do not live out the truth, okay? Understand that, hear that word. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Walking in the light. I'm gonna tell you, walking in the light in your relationships, in other words, walking in the truth, not living one way and acting another when you're with, you know, 
it, it is, is a massive, massive relationship builder. It's, a, it's what grows relationships, walking and living in the, in the truth. It says if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we fellowship with one another. And so really, there are two things I'm going to grab from that. One is when you're walking with Jesus, you're in the light. In other words, you know, you're not, if you're not trying to hide from Jesus, it means you're probably living uh, in a truthful manner. And uh, if you, th- th- then you have fellowship with him, but it also says that you have fellowship with one another. And I tell you, probably the greatest buster of relationships is when people start hiding things from each other and lying to each other. You start hiding and lying, uh, you are destroying your relationship. And so, uh, and so growth, relational growth, one of the making growing points is that to walk in the light, to walk in the light of Christ, to walk in the light with each other, to, re, to, to not be hiding things from each other. And, not, and, and that, that's even true for children. You know, People who lie to their children, um, you, you will suffer great consequence for that. Do not lie to your children. Do not, do, not, uh, do not deceive them because that breaks trust in one of the most vital relationships that they have and it makes it very hard for them to trust God when the people that they've been most relying on have lied to them. And so do not lie to your children. Do not walk in the light. That doesn't mean you have to tell them everything at all times, but, it, but don't lie to them. Um, you know, sometimes... Hunter, he can, he's so inquisitive and he can ask such specific questions. It's like, you know, ask me that question five years from now. I'm not talking about things he needs to know, but I'm saying, you know, like, uh, he might go, well, dad, how much money do you have in the bank? You know? So I just say, well, it depends on the hour. It depends on how many times I bought you ice cream or whatever, you know? And, uh, you know, about, you know, let's just say if I, if I only had $10 in the bank, and he goes, my dad has $10 in the bank. That'd be kind of embarrassing, wouldn't it? And what if I had a million dollars in the bank? I told him I had a million dollars in the bank. He goes, my dad has a million dollars. You know, it's just something you have, to, you have to be a certain point to say, have that conversation. But it's, so he, you know, he's always asking real specific questions about everything. And so, you know, sometimes I just say, you know, you're not at the stage for us to have this conversation, but a little bit older, you will be. And uh, so um, just tell them the truth. Tell each other the truth. It is one of the most freeing things. We have so many people here in this body that have been in Celebrate Recovery or in Celebrate Recovery, whatever. And one of the greatest, if those who really, really overcome things are the ones who start walking in the light, who start telling the truth. And, uh, and, and when you start telling the truth in your life, it sets you free, sets relationships. I'm not saying it makes relationships perfect. It doesn't, but it sure it sure keeps from breaking relationships down. And, uh, and, and so growth requires truth. Number three, growth requires nurture. Um, just look at a couple of, uh, or three, three different proverbs here. It says, the words of the reckless pierce like swords. And let me just say this. Probably in, in years back when I did a lot of counseling, uh, I would say the most common pain that people carried with them wasn't even so much things done to them, but it was words that had been spoken to them. Even though some people had had some pretty severe things done to them, the words spoken to them often were the things the hardest to heal from. So I, I, I just need to tell you, words matter. You know, we've said it before, but the little phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never... Yeah, it's a lie, isn't it? Words hurt. Words go deep. They go deeper than a bruise will go. Not, not that bruises are good, but I'm just saying they go into the deepest places. So the words of the reckless pierce like swords. I like to say words can kill or words can heal. You have to make a decision. Are your words going to kill or are your words going to heal? And uh, the next part of the verse talks about the healing. It says, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. In your marriage, do your words cause hurt or do they bring healing? You say, well, if they were like this, then, you know, I don't read any place here where there's conditions involved. It is simply stating the words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. What about with your children? 
Or what about with your elderly parents? Or what about if you're a teenager here, what about with your parents? You know, this is something I guess I never knew until I had little kids, but little kids can hurt your feelings. Do you know that? Little Emily, she acts like she's going to come to me, and then she sees Nana, like, Nana, running off. I'm, that doesn't hurt deep. I, I love her to love Nana, okay? And she's always loved Nana way more than me. And for the first six months, I was totally, who, who am I anyway, you know? She's only recently gotten a, gotten a liking for pops, you know? But, uh, but the deal is, little kids can can reject us, they can say things that can hurt. But big kids can hurt too. And I mean, adults, we, we can really say some things that are hard, hard to reel back. We can even apologize, but the words still ring a little there. Very, very important when it comes to this nurturing thing, the words we say. It doesn't mean that you don't say tough things to people. I believe in saying tough things to people but I believe we had better say it in a spirit of love. And when we don't, we need to do a little self-check. Um, and so, and make sure that even in our harshness, if that's not really a word I wanna use there, but even our toughness maybe is a better word for that, and our toughness, that we don't demean people. You can correct somebody, you can correct a child without demeaning their character or demeaning uh, the, the value of who they are. And then the next verse says, anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers it up. Last night, uh, Hunter came down with an earache. He's only had a couple in his lifetime, but this one was, seemed to be pretty severe because he was wailing obnoxiously, wailing, just wailing, you know, We're hanging onto his ear, you know, I might as well die. My ear's killing me. You know, I mean, it was bad. It was so bad. And you know, we were just sort of wrapping up last minute things, whatever it was for today, both of Angie and I both. And uh, kind of like, I mean, what are you going to do with it? I mean, it's like, we, you know, it's like nine or 10 o'clock at night on Saturday night. And, you know, we had church tomorrow. What do we, and he's just, and uh, uh, Vanjie had stepped out of the room to do something. And he was, he's going, Nobody even cares that I'm dying from my earache. He was like, and I said, well, Hunter, no, I care. What am I, you know, I, I mean, we're trying to figure out what to do. And, uh, you know, and he was just, he was just catastrophized. He was, he was hoping somehow we could cheer him up. It's kind of hard. You know, he was so bad off. So finally, you know, Vanjie said, well, I'm going to take him to the emergency room. Because I don't think, I mean, whatever, even if he's better when we get there, at least we'll get the medicine going and all that. So she hauled him off to the emergency room last night. Kind of late on Saturday night. And you know, just the fact that we're going to, okay, we're, we're going to take care of something. He was still hanging on to his ear, but I could tell he was feeling better. It cheered him up. Like, You're going to do something to help me. You're helping me, you know? And, uh, and I asked him this morning, I said, well, hey, how did it go last night? And uh, he said, he said, well, they told me I just need to calm down a little bit and I'd feel better. <laughs> I said, well, I guess if, if, if it was good to take you to the hospital with no other reason, let them tell you that. We were trying to tell you that, but it wasn't working, you know. Well, our cheering up wasn't doing too good. So, there, you know, sometimes people are just, you know, anxious enough or whatever. In that moment, you can't cheer them up. But you can, you, it doesn't mean you still have to, you know, I mean, there's a side of me that just wanted to go, you know, okay, everybody has pain. We all got pain. We're going to get this fixed. Come on, Hunter. You're nine years old. Grow up a little bit. You know, just man up on this thing. You know, there's that one side of me, but there's another side of going, you know, I know, I know an earache can really, really hurt. And, uh, and so, you know, um, but, I, but I didn't know how to cheer him up. Vanjie cheered him up by taking him to the emergency room. Um, light in a messenger's eyes brings joy to the heart. And good news gives health to the bones. Have you ever just felt better just because of some good news? I can remember... This is real, real recent to me. You know, you guys know about this. My brother, uh, my brother, my oldest brother, Rick, and I had just stepped out of a meeting at his church at 8.30 that night, and his phone went off, Rick's phone went off, and it was Randy telling us that he received a heart. He was going to receive a heart. 
in that, I was staying with my brother Steve down there, so I went on to the house, to his house, and uh, we were sitting up in his living room just talking about this and figuring out how we're going to get there who's, and, um, and, uh, and how we're working all the details of that out. But it's like we both were kind of giddy. I said, Steve, I'm just giddy. I don't even know how to go to bed. I just feel giddy. It's such, you know, this is just like, I, I just want to pinch it. You know, it's like, this is such good news. Such good news. And uh, it made it hard to sleep. And then I woke up at 4 o'clock in the morning, and he'd, Randy had said he'd probably call me in the middle of the night once he knew exactly when the surgery was going to take place. Well, he didn't call me in the middle of the night. It's because the surgery kept getting pushed back because of other organs that were being donated, and it kept delaying uh, getting over to him. So, um, so when I woke up at 4 and hadn't heard, all of a sudden I felt heavy in my heart. Because I was like, oh, no, maybe it didn't work out. Because it wasn't 100%. It was like almost, but not 100%. I had to almost force myself to try to go back to sleep until a little later. I didn't want to call him at 4 o'clock. And that next morning when I got that call again, um, and he said, it's on, Rod, but it's not for a few hours yet. And, uh, and it's 100% sure I'm getting the heart that's been approved. And uh, such good news. There was a gentleman, I maybe have talked to you about this, I can't remember for sure who I've told this to, but there was a guy that was in the unit with Randy up there that had been in there for six months. Um, he, uh, he had um, pumps on both sides of his heart and uh, had some antibody issues. It was a very unique situation to get the right heart. Uh, he was doing good at walking, trying to keep, stay, keep strong so he'd be available for a heart when it came in. And when Randy found out, Randy had been there maybe almost five weeks whenever in the same ICU unit, uh, whenever he found out, he got his heart. And so he told the nurses, don't tell Brandon about this. I need to go down and tell him myself. One of the hardest things Randy had to do in this was go down to his room and tell him in person that he had received a heart. He was receiving a heart, but he felt obligated, felt like he really needed to tell him that in person. And that was probably the biggest grief that Randy felt about receiving a heart. And, um, and you know, you almost you have these guilt feelings almost sometimes whenever you know something came from someone's death and then there are other people waiting for a heart also and that kind of thing. So, um, so he did, went on in the, the third day after he was recovering, we was just starting to come to maybe the fourth day. Um, he was awake enough. One of the nurses came in and said, hey, um, Brandon wants to come and talk to you. And uh, he came in and he um, came over to Randy's. And of course, when he goes, moved around, he had like all these, I mean, it takes an entourage to go with him because all the stuff he's hooked up to. He came over to Randy's, the IC unit Randy was in. And, uh, and he said, Randy, I just wanted to come and tell you in person that I've been told that I'm getting a heart. My brother sent me a picture of the two of them that had been taken while I was with the two of them uh, and uh, then told me the story in a text. And I was driving down the road, and I shouldn't have been. I stopped. It was a stoplight, I promise. I don't text and drive. I really don't. But I, it was a stoplight. I pulled that up and looked at it. And uh, when I saw that news, I felt goosebumps go all over me because it was just, that was such good news. I felt like that man may perish up there. He might have to go home to his funeral. And uh, now he's been given a chance at life. I'm going to tell you, good news will affect you physically. It affects you physically. And when you haven't had good news for a while, it makes you ill. And I need to tell you, that's the reason, one of the reasons why we have to focus on the good news of the gospel, because that's the, that's the core good news. But we also need to focus on, on nurturing good news issues, things that can bring good news in our relationships, because it lifts us up, it encourages us. So be somebody who's a messenger of good news to the people in your life, you know, uh, don't always tell them all the things that are wrong. With you. Talk about what's wrong with you, certainly. But don't always think of some things that are positive and encourage and to build up those in, 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 your, in your family. Uh, learn their love language. And if you don't know anything about that, you can Google it. You can take tests online, everything. You can learn, learn their love language and speak their love language to them. Um, if you're married, uh, you know, some people enjoy the his needs, her needs approach. But there's a lot of information out there about that. But pay attention to what your spouse's needs are and, uh, and, and work hard at meeting those needs. Um, 
over, overcome, uh, you know, adversity. Uh, and, 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 you know, whenever you think about this, growth requires nurture, but part of the growth of a plant, if you really want a plant to really do well, you'll do what? You'll fertilize it. I don't want to get too graphic here or anything, but, you know, fertilizer, there's different kinds of fertilizer, but, you know, I, I lived near a farm one time when I was assistant pastor in uh, um, Pennsylvania, and they had a big old fertilizer producing bin out there, and that didn't smell real good. That was, that thing, when they were working that thing up and stirring it up, that was, you wanted to go someplace else. I was ready to go to the city. You know, it was, it was, it was not smelling all that great. Well, I'm going to tell you, it requires, I don't know why, but it requires a little bit of fertilizer in your life for you to grow. Without anything negative ever happening to you, you will never grow in the same way that you will with that resistance. So don't look at every negative thing that happens in your life as bad. Realize that God wants, it may be bad, but God wants to use it for good. He's a redeeming God. He's a redemptive God. He takes what is meant for evil even, as Joseph said, and he brings good from it. Someone can even be against you, working against you, maybe a former spouse or a former boyfriend or, or you know, a, a parent that's gone awry and they've just you know, treated you terribly. Uh, it, it, you, you, those things can work very, very much against you. But I want to tell you, God wants to even take that and use it for good. I'm just telling you, he does. He's a redemptive God. That's how he works. Number four, growth requires reciprocity. I can't hardly say that word, but I know it's a real word. It is a real word, I promise you. Uh, But um, it, it requires give and take is ultimately what we're saying here. It says, walk with the wise and become wise. For a companion of fools suffers harm. In life, we need to have relationships where there's great give and take. Remember last week I talked about reaching up, reaching across, reaching down? If all you ever do is reach down, you'll feel like a hero a lot of your life. But the truth of the matter is, you won't re- you, you'll, you'll end up being very barren inside. And so you have to have strong peer relationships and you have to have some strong relationships that are stronger in certain places and points than you are that you're reaching up to. Don't just take from them. Like I said, sometimes people that I've reached up to, I've actually written them a check or given them a gift card to thank them for that. There are others that are good enough friends of mine that they wouldn't receive it and that kind of thing. But here's, but what I want to tell you is you need to make sure that it's give and take. Relationships, the best relationships in the world, the best marriages are where nobody is feeling taken advantage of. If you're feeling taken advantage of, you either have a self-pity problem or you have another kind of problem, and that is an imbalance in your relationship. And so, so you, you know, a lot of times people say, just try harder, try harder, try harder. Well, you can try harder to the point that you're depleted to nothing. The point is you, may, you need to address it. When it comes to a certain point and you feel like it's way out of balance, you've got to address it. And the best way to address that typically is for counseling. And certainly it's very critical who you go to counsel for. And, you know, we try to give some guidance on that. If you're, if you're interested in asking you know, for that information, uh, we certainly try to help you uh, find somebody that's beneficial to you in that way. Um, but it prob- the truth is this, who you walk with, who you interact with, and how they interact with you is going to determine much of who you are. Walk with the wise, you'll be wise. Walk with fools, you end up being a fool. And it's just the truth. You've got to have this back and forth, this receptivity. There's a give and take. Now, that doesn't mean in every relationship, but you've got to have it in your primary relationships. In your primary relationships, they should not be you reaching down so far or reaching up so far. It's got to be where you're giving and taking a lot of this. doesn't mean one of you is going to be a lot better with money than the other. One of you is going to be a lot better with the emotions than the other. Another is going to be a whole lot better in, with, with relationships than the other. I mean, you, that's where you balance each other out, but that's where you reach across. And one of the words that I like to use, especially if you're going to be married or marry somebody, you do not want to be codependent. And if you say, what is that? Well, come on Celebrate Recovery. Come to Celebrate Recovery Thursday night, and they will explain it to you way better than I can in two minutes here. Okay? If you, 
And, and so if, if you're in a codependent relationship, you want to address that. If you're in an entirely independent kind of relationship, I do my thing, you do your thing. We live under the same roof, but that's all we do. We go th- I go this way, you go that way. That's not healthy. What I like to view a healthy relationship is interdependence. And that is, this person could choose to live by themselves. They could do it. They could handle life. They can go on. This person could choose to live by themselves, but they say, you know what? I think as a team, we'll do so much better. So let's, let's, let's be interdependent. You offer a lot of great things, and I offer a lot of great things. We, bring, we make a better team than we do by ourselves. That's a healthy relationship, interdependence. Once it goes to counterdependence, where all you're doing is always trying to pick somebody up off the floor, it's very unhealthy. Or if you feel like all they're doing is trying to pick you up off the floor, it's very unhealthy. Or if you feel like, I don't need anybody or anything, I'm just going to do it my own way. Nice to know you, and nice to have you around and everything, but I live my own life the way I live it. Not good. Number five, growth requires warmth or love. We call it as love. You know, most plants, you know, Vanjie's, she, she wants to be a uh, gardener. She works at it, but time gets in her way sometimes. And so, but uh, she has some plants that have lived a very long time. And so I notice when temperatures get to a certain point, she wants to move them to the garage. And every once in a while, she enlists my help. And I gladly do it. No, anyway. You can figure that out. Um, but here's what I'm going to tell you. Plants require a certain amount of warmth. Human beings, the warmth that human beings require is a certain amount of love. We require love. We will die without love. Now, the problem is we have a lot of misconceptions about what love is. And so those misconceptions just drive us into things oftentimes in relationships that we shouldn't have. And they end up producing things that don't benefit us, don't really grow us. So what I want to say is this. Please love the people around you in your primary relationships. And remember, love is a verb. It's an action. Love is a commitment. And a lot of times it's a feeling, but you got to put that feeling behind the action, the commitment. If you put it first, it becomes very conditional. I don't feel like doing that because I don't feel, you know, there's a lot of things you do in relationship, primary relationships don't have anything to do with feeling. Clean up spilled milk. I don't know anybody that's going, well, I just love clean up spilled milk. You know that old line saying, you know, and, and, and well, it's just spilled milk. I just love clean up spilled milk. It just reminds me it's just spilled milk. No big deal. I don't, you know, I don't know anybody that loves doing that. I don't know anybody that loves changing poopy diapers. I don't know anybody that loves getting up in the middle of the night and trying to, you know, take care of a colicky baby. I don't know anybody who loves, but people do it all the time. You know why they do it? Because they love that person enough to do it whether they feel like doing it or not. They might sometimes nudge your spouse and go, I've done the last 20, middle of the night, your turn, baby. You're saying, you know, you got to show a little love tonight. You got to show some love tonight. Okay. I'm not saying that's work as a team and do that stuff, but I'm just telling you, we, if you really love the primary people in your life, you will always be doing things that you don't necessarily feel like doing because you're committed and because you know love is action. You know, and I've said this before to Hunter and Skyler, and, and they, they understand my jokes, okay? You guys may not sometimes, but they do. And that is, I'm going, man, you guys better be glad. You better be glad you're little cuddle bugs. Man, I'd be putting you up for auction here, what, you know, or something, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd be selling you in Walmart if you, you know, some, but, but the, here's what, sometimes when we had a rough day, and maybe they've had some attitudes, it would never be me, of course, but anyway, but, but you know, things have just not been perfect. Um, and one of them crawls up in my lap, in my chair, and just sort of snuggles there. All the, you know, like aggravation and everything just seems to melt away. And I'm going to tell you, you don't start with affection. You start with commitment, and you start with action. 
and affection comes along, along the way sometimes. And it's a really great bonus when it does. Last one is growth requires knowledge. All who are prudent act with knowledge, but fools expose their folly. This last verse here is the one I wanted you just to please grasp. The purpose of a person's heart, heart are deep waters, but one who has insight draws them out. How well do you know the primary people in your life? Do you ever drop the bucket down into the well of their spirit, of their soul, of their being, and pull up the deep stuff? Have you ever asked your spouse, what are your dreams? What are your hopes? What are your aspirations? What, what, at this point in life, what would you like to accomplish? What would you like to see happen? What would you like to see for us? What's your vision for us? What is your hopes for us? You might be surprised if you ask that question. With children, it's very, very much so how you might go about that. And I'm not here to give a big lesson about that. I'm just simply saying this. It says this. The purposes of a person's heart are deep waters. But the one who has insight draws them out. You know, Billy, you know as a counselor that oftentimes people will come and they'll talk to you about surfacey issues. But at some point along the way, you get enough insight, you start dropping that bucket down a little deeper and deeper, and all of a sudden the real stuff starts to come out. It starts to come out. You don't have to be a counselor to do that, but you do have to be a listener. And you do have to commit time. And the person has to believe that you want to know the truth. Because a lot of times we don't tell people the truth because we don't think they want to hear it. Right? I'm just praying that as you look over this list, as God speaks to your heart, if there's some primary relationship in your life, that you would just say, to kind of evaluate it and go, I think I'm doing pretty good here, pretty good here, pretty good here. Boy, this one here, I need to change some things. Just let God's spirit guide you on.